Major funding for Charlie Rose is provided by the people at DuPont, originators of products and ideas that make a difference in everyday life. DuPont, better things for better living. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the annual financial support of viewers like you. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders. Welcome to the broadcast tonight as we continue to mark the end of World War II, the incredible story of American POWs in Japan. I considered that my trip into hell. Uh, there's practically no way to describe uh, what went on in those camps and the, and the, the, the smell of death and the, and the horrible beatings and the starvation. And the, uh, it, was, it, it was an experience that's uh, uh, very difficult to describe. And the controversy over HIV testing of pregnant mothers. Get prenatal care and counseling to mothers at the very beginning of pregnancy to tell them what their options are for treatment uh, and for good prenatal care and to try to prevent HIV infection in the child. I'm truly afraid that these women will be driven from the health care system if this is handled the wrong way, that they will not return with their babies for care because they'll be afraid that those children will be taken. And a new comedy review in New York called Loose Lips. Loose Lips is a show about our times and about our mania for reality and Court yeah. TV and all the different yeah. news services that we hunger for. POWs in Japan, HIV testing, and a comedy review that just opened in New York when we continue. During World War II, one in 25 American prisoners of war died in Nazi prison camps. That's one in 25. For the American prisoners of the Japanese, the figure was one in three. With the perspective that honorable men would prefer death to captivity, the Japanese military felt at liberty to torture, experiment with, and murder soldiers in their prison camps. What happened in the Japanese camps during World War II, and why that information was never made known to the public, is the focus of a book called The Prisoners of the Japanese. Joining me now, the author of that book, Gavin Dawes, who spent 10 years researching and interviewing former prisoners, with him or two former POWs, Otto Schwartz, a forced laborer on the Burma Siam Railroad, and Richard Gordon, a survivor of the Bataan Death March. I am very pleased, especially to have the two of you here, uh, and to take a look at this uh, very interesting and uh, important book that was some 10 years in the making. How did it begin? It began as uh, all my books begin by accident. In this case, I was in a bar in Honolulu, as I sometimes am. Yeah. And at the end of the bar was a guy talking about being a prisoner of the Japanese. And I sort of sidled up to him and sat with him and talked to him. And we talked again, became friends. He introduced me to other surviving prisoners. And that ballooned in, uh, in uh, quantum leaps of magnitude. Who lived in Honolulu. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, and then to the mainland, right. then ultimately right. to Britain, to Singapore, to Hong Kong, to Canada, to the Netherlands, East Indies, and uh, archives in the United States and Australia and Britain and so on. In the end, I interviewed probably a thousand surviving ex-prisoners and read probably 10 miles of archival documents. And uh, the book took longer than the war, which is a, a source of great regret because many of the guys in the book uh, didn't survive to read it. Yeah. And you found out that there were two kinds of reactions. Uh, in terms of people who held this story within them, mm. and it was? The two extremes are, one, that there are men who simply cannot talk about it even 50 years later. Uh, they, they have it in their, their body and their spirit and their brain, and it's, it's dominated their lives and obsessed them, but they, they can't say the words, and that's unhealthy. And the other extreme is, is men who can't stop talking about it, and it, it's dominated their lives in, in the opposite way. Uh, the lucky ones, and it's, it's a dreadful thing to apply the word luck to anybody who is a prisoner of the Japanese, but the lucky survivors like Otto and like Richard, 50 years on, have in some way come to terms with that experience. They're not in, come to terms with what ought to be done about that experience now. To read the story is, it is, is except for the Holocaust, 
the most extraordinary sense of defilement and, and, and uh, torture that I've read about in warfare. Well, my problem, and my problem is nothing, as I say in the preface to the book, I think as a prisoner of the Japanese, I would have lasted three and a half days. That's my, my judgment of myself. These guys had to try to last, they didn't know how long, three and a half years. One in three didn't, two out of three made it, including Otto and Richard. Mm -hmm. But the, what happened to them physically is still with them. Fifty years later, the survivors are in their bodies ten to fifteen years older than they are by the calendar to be a prisoner of the Japanese for three and a half years, aged the body 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. In the brain, it's a matter of trying after 50 years not to have nightmares. I've talked to guys who have nightmares every week, every month, sometimes every night. They go through the day knowing that when their head hits the pillow, they're going to be back in POW camp. I'll come back and we'll talk about why this story mm -hmm. has not come out yeah. before yeah. and all of the implications of that. Tell me your story. Tell me, take us there if you can and if you will. Well, my story began um, when I was 18 years old uh, aboard the heavy cruiser USS Houston. And uh, we were um, uh, practically alone out in the South Pacific uh, fighting against overwhelming Japanese odds. And uh, uh, the uh, outcome was uh, predictable. We ended up being sunk in a very, very fierce uh, uh, battle uh, off the western coast of Java. Uh, I was. Uh, captured by the Japanese in the water after swimming about 14, 16 hours. And uh, I was um, introduced into Japanese hospitality by being forced to pull a cartload of ammunition with the troops as they advanced on the island for four days and four nights without food, without clothing, without water, and being beaten constantly with a rifle butt. That was my introduction. And I found out that it was to get much worse later. and. Uh, I was with the first group of Americans to leave Java to go to Burma to work on the infamous Burma Siam Death Railway. And I worked uh, the entire length of the railroad until it was finished in uh, December of 1943. Um, I considered that my trip into hell. Uh, there's practically no way to describe uh, what went on in those camps and the, and the, the, the smell of death and the and the horrible beatings and the starvation and the, uh, it was it, it was an experience that's uh, uh, very difficult to describe and it takes people like Gavin who can properly describe it uh, whereas uh, those of us who were there uh, when we start talking about it too deeply it, it starts to hit a little too close uh, I've been very fortunate in my life because I was one of those who felt that the best therapy for me was to be um, uh, open with it and to talk. So I have uh, given uh, thousands and thousands of lectures to high school children, and I have a slide presentation. So I talk very freely about it. Um, and that's been therapy? That, to me, it's been therapy. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've dispensed with the nightmares years ago. Um, occasionally, someone will ask me a question during one of my lectures that will open up something deep in, that had been locked up and I may not sleep that night, but it's a, a worthwhile price to tell the story because history has kind of uh, uh, left us behind and uh, well, hasn't come, reported. I want right. to come back to that point, and that's a crucial point in this story. In my particular case, Charlie, I joined the regular army in 1940, and I'm a regular army soldier, remained such for 20 some odd years. And I enlisted for the Philippines. So everything I got, I asked for, and I have no complaints in that field. Uh, I went to the Philippines and I joined the only American infantry regiment we had there, 31st U.S. Infantry. Uh, one infantry regiment when the Japanese finally struck in the Philippines. And uh, we were there, we arrived there in October of 40, and we had 14 months prior to the war breaking out, which for me was a lifesaver. It conditioned me for what came about. And when we went into Bataan, uh, we found ourselves with 100,000 Filipino soldiers, practically untrained and 12,000 American soldiers with food for perhaps 30 days. Uh, between the lack of food, malaria, the most heavily infested malaria area in the world at that time was Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines. So by March of the 1st of 1942, most of our people, 80% of our troops, were sick with malaria. There was no food. Our rations were twice a day, eating half of what we normally would eat, and that was salmon, 
American rice twice daily, which no American could really uh, get by with. And then in the midst of all that, fight off Japanese attacks. And so when the Japanese came through, and they finally came through on the 3rd of April of 1942, uh, they had a very sick, diseased army facing them. And it was just a question of time until the army fell. When we ran out of food, and we had one day's supply of food left when Bataan surrendered. And General King was our commanding general. And General King said, in essence, that there's a limit to human endurance that we've reached that. And he went uh, and surrendered to the Japanese. But he asked three times of the Japanese, would you assure me that my men will be treated decently? And all three times he was ignored. On the fourth time, he asked, and they said basically to him, we are not barbarians. Well, they were barbarians. They treated us as animals. They told us we were animals. In a recent trip I made to Japan three years ago, four years ago, I met one of my former prison guards. And he told me right to my face, <clears throat> you were animals. We were told to treat you as animals. Any man that surrenders is dishonorable, and therefore he should uh, be treated as less than a, a human being. But when Bataan fell, we found ourselves with something like 100,000 men trying to march out of the Bataan Peninsula with no food, no water, and everybody sick. And in my own particular experience, it took us 10 days, it took me 10 days, to make that march. In that time, I never ate anything that the Japanese gave us because we had nothing. They gave us nothing. Water, if it wasn't me knowing how to conserve my water, I would have died from lack of water, as most men did. On that march, we lost at least 700 the Americans, conservatively estimated and about 10,000 Filipinos died in that march. And when we arrived in our first prison camp, uh, we arrived there by virtue of a train, where they packed men into a railroad car of the old 1918 vintage, where men couldn't sit down, they had to stand up. They died standing up because of the lack of air in that car. Uh, they shut the doors on us, and they carried us for three hours in the train, in the hottest temperature going. When we got off the train, they marched us some more into our first prison camp were done. We had one water spigot for 3,000 men. They'd turn the water on and they would turn it off after so many hours. And many men were without water. Uh, we, we all had disease of one kind or another. Malaria was killing off men where the Filipinos were dying at a rate of 500 a day in Camp O'Donnell, a very infamous prison camp if ever there was one. The Americans, we lost 1,600 there in 40 days. Let me interrupt this story only to say, because I want to come back to why this story has never been told. And, and not to be sensationalistic, but if this is a document mm -hmm. of man's inhumanity to man. What's the worst thing you saw? The worst thing I saw was beheading. The worst thing I saw was tanks rolling over human bodies that were sleeping on the side of the road. Uh, the worst thing I saw was men being stuck with a bayonet when he had done nothing other than try to get water. Uh, these are some of the things that stick in your mind down through the years that you never forget, and I remember them to this day. Well, I, I've seen so many acts of barbarianism. Uh, in the jungle, building the railroad, uh, uh, everyone was sick. M malaria, dysentery, beriberi, pellagra, some disease. The, the thing we dreaded the most, for instance, was tropical ulcers, which is a, is a disease uh, that's caused by a, a break in the skin, which becomes infected, and then all the flesh is eaten away. And uh, I have seen Japanese guards kick a man on the ground in the open wound, which was uh, right down to the bone, just kick him in, in that wound and then stand there and laugh. There uh, are stories uh, here also of, of all kinds of barbarism having to do with, with uh, pressure tanks so that the eyes actually all jab. Yeah, the, there are stories of living autopsy, autopsies on people who are living. Mm -hmm. There are stories of all kinds of infections with disease to test and it's, it's all to, to do use prisoners for tests to determine certain kinds of, of uh, medical endurance all of those kinds of things why has this story not been told before 1995 when i had talked to maybe 10 15 a dozen 100 prisoners and decided that there was a book in it for me, you know, selfishly, that there was a book in it for me. I went to the official histories, and the official history done by the Japanese is um, 102 volumes, amounting to millions of words, and their side of the war in immense detail. Not one word about the prison camps on the Japanese side. 
And I suppose, in, in a way, that's not greatly surprising. But then to go to the Allied histories done by the Americans, the Australians, the British and the Dutch in the 5, 10, 15 years after the war, they cumulatively are more than 100 volumes, in other words, millions of words. And the number of words devoted to their own POWs, Allied POWs, you could read before lunch. So they disappeared from history in the official histories. Why? Why was that? Well, if I had an intelligent MA student 